I'd like to talk about power plants and the future of clean energy. Now, the media has done a really great job at getting everything completely backwards and putting all the focus in the wrong places. So I'd like to give you a private equity investor's perspective on the current state of renewable energy development along with some of the new technologies coming down the pipeline. Now, there's three things I'd like to talk about. One is the current state of energy demand and why we need clean energy. Two is the intermittent technologies like solar and wind. And three are the baseload technologies which provide power 24-7 like hydrothermal or hydroelectric and geothermal. Now, we all know there's a great demand for energy and it's increasing every day. By 2030, we're projected to need four terawatts of power plant capacity. To give you a range of reference, one megawatt powers about a thousand homes, and a terawatt is a million megawatts. So that's a 70 percent increase from where we are today. Essentially, we need to build a new 500 megawatt power plant, which is a multi-billion dollar project, every other day for the next 20 years. So let's see where some of this energy is coming from. Today in the U.S., where we consume a quarter of the world's energy with less than 5 percent of its people, the vast majority of our power comes from coal, about 45 percent. Now the scary thing is, in 2010, we commissioned more coal plants than we have in any other year in the past quarter century. Now as for the others, natural gas is great, but price volatility makes building a new power plant very risky. The last time we broke ground in a nuclear plant was in 1974. And while in the 1940s, hydroelectric dams supplied 75% of the power in the West, today it's nearly impossible to permit a new project. As you'll see, some of the other renewables have a large number of projects in the pipeline, but while coal is dropping multi-billion dollar projects, we're still playing around in the millions. So what's the big deal with coal? Well, aside from the Al Gore effect, here's some of the emissions. Side effects include leukemia, neurotoxicity, pulmonary edema, not to mention smog, acid rain, acidification of soil and water, and destruction of entire ecosystems. China is a great example of what we don't want to be like. Here's a picture of what happens when you're exposed to airborne arsenic. Or how would you like to need a mask to go outside because the pollution's so bad? Just a little FYI, in 2008, UC Berkeley did a study and found that 29% of the airborne lead in San Francisco came from China. But while the environment and your health, it's all nice and everything, ultimately it all comes down to cost. The great thing is renewables are getting there. Even now, there are many projects which are already cheaper than coal. And every year, new technologies are breaking down barriers to bigger, better, and more profitable resources. So solar seems to get all the hype today. And the big problem with solar, well, other than nighttime, is the fact that the energy density of the sun is simply very low. To have a large, significant-sized power plant you would need roughly three square miles of photovoltaics. That's almost twice the size of Del Mar. However, solar does have its own unique advantages in that you can generate power on a small rooftop scale, and saving money on your utility bill can be two to three times better than the price you would get by selling power to the utility from a power plant. The price point at which everybody will be rushing to install solar on the rooftop seems to be about a dollar per watt, and we're getting there. Over the past 15 years, the price of solar has been slashed in half repeatedly by the technology race. There's two main competing realms, thin films and concentrators. Now, thin films seem to have the cost advantages they can produce on a continuous printing press similar to newspapers, while concentrators are more focused on higher efficiency, focusing light using lenses on a small, highly efficient, multi-junction cell. Now, in the end, a winner will emerge, and a giant like Sharp will end up picking up the technology, mass producing, and bringing it to market with a reliable warranty. Now, wind farms are obviously very resource dependent, because the more often and the stronger the wind blows at your site, the more money you're going to make. There are many good sites where you can make 30% plus IRR, meaning if you invest $100 million in a project, you can get $30 million per year in return. However, there are some very significant barriers to many good resources, and scalability is quite the issue. The footprint is huge. Many people have a not-my-backyard mentality. Logistics is a complete nightmare. Have you ever seen one of these trucks the size of a train? You know that getting to the top of a hill can be quite an issue. And transmission can be a big problem in large projects where 
hundreds of megawatts come and go with the wind. However, there's some very exciting new advancements in the industry, and we're opening up doors to bigger and more powerful resources. Now, the power output increases exponentially with wind velocity, meaning if you have twice the wind speed at your site, you could get eight times the power output. So some of the new developments are opening up resources like high altitude wind and offshore wind where the wind speed is tremendously faster and more consistent. If we can figure out how to harness the energy of something like the jet stream where strong winds blow 24-7, we would have an incredible power source with massive output, big profitability, and we would start turning this from an intermittent technology to base load. Now, hydroelectric dams have been cheaper than coal for a long time now, and there's still terawatts of power available around the world. And the great thing about hydro is that with a single site, you can build on an enormous scale. Here's a snapshot of some of the projects around the world where you can see that China, India, and Brazil all have projects over 10,000 megawatts. This is permitting. The footprint's enormous. Take the Three Gorges Dam in China, for instance. That's over 18,000 megawatts. That's the equivalent of burning over 11,000 barrels of oil per hour. Now, the media was quick to vilify the project for the fact that they displaced millions of people. However, they failed to mention that big floods cause catastrophic natural disasters for decades. And the last one in 1998 left 14 million people homeless, left 4,000 casualties, and caused 24 billion in economic loss. The new IT development nowadays is run of river projects where instead of building a dam, you divert a small portion of the flow through a tunnel down the side of a hill, and that's a much smaller footprint. From an investor's perspective, risk is pretty low, you can get a fairly high return, and the uh, profitability can be pretty good, about 20% plus IRR. However, it's a very significant undertaking, long development timelines, and Permitting is just a nightmare. Now, geothermal, unfortunately, is a largely underrepresented renewable. However, it can be by far the most profitable when you start approaching the energy densities and temperatures of magma. In the best resources, you could drill a well that costs a few million dollars and have $20 million plus every year in steam generating electricity. California is the mecca. In between San Diego and San Francisco, there's a handful of resources that generate more power output than any other country in the world. And guess who's the biggest producer? It's Chevron. Right in our backyard, Warren Buffett has a power plant, outputs 340 megawatts in the Salton Sea, where a single well puts out 30 megawatts. That one well is more power output than the majority of solar or wind projects. In Nevada, there's 65 projects in development, and it's coined the term the geothermal gold rush. The footprint's real small. Here's a picture of the Mammoth power plant. Most people don't even realize they're staring straight at it when they turn off the highway for the mountain. If you have a great project, you can get an incredible return, 60% plus IRR. This is the risk. There's heavy upfront cost in drilling, and you can't secure debt until the resource is proven. And if X doesn't mark the spot, you could end up with a very expensive hole. Now, nearly all of the geothermal resources in the US were built in the 70s and 80s by oil drillers. Modern technology is completely changing our approach. We have new tools that are specific to the industry rather than borrowing them from oil and gas. Well, in the past, we would see an active geyser and we would simply start drilling around it or we would accidentally find water while drilling for oil. Today, we have a much more scientific approach. We have new hyperspectral imaging tools which allow us to identify mineral indicators and target new blind resources from an airplane or a satellite. New active seismic filtering algorithms are allowing us to image the subsurface like never before, where we can actually pinpoint key faults in drilling structures. Advances in deep drilling through hard rock are gearing up to change the entire economics of the industry. Today, it's typically prohibitive to drill past 12,000 feet because the cost of drilling increases exponentially with depth. However, if we could reduce the frequency that you need to change a bit, which is the overwhelming cost when you're down 10,000 feet and the tripping time to bring the bit back up to the surface, change it and put it back down can be weeks. We could drill much deeper at a small fraction of the cost. One of the most exciting new realms in this development is called thermal spallation. 
where they use extreme heat and water jets to disintegrate the rock rather than grinding it down with a consumable bit. When we work the kinks out of this, we're going to open up doors to a whole new realm of deep, high temperature resources with incredible power output and massive profitability. So we discussed the need for clean energy. We saw some of the challenges and the innovations in the uh, intermittent technologies, and we saw the state of development of baseload and where some of the industries are headed. We know that the price of fossil fuels is rising and the cost of renewables is declining. The issue is timing of scale. We need to move quickly, otherwise we might find ourselves in a very nasty place. Thank you.